All right, welcome those students of mine from Scarborough. Uh, we're setting we're setting up the talk. I'm setting up the talk. So I would I would say so the immigration system. What is it? It, it, it comes into being through the coordinated work practices of administrators, of lawyers, uh, and of doctors when we look at the medical program. And so their practices coordinate with each other across time and place inside and outside of the country. And their coordinated work practices, my research shows, gives rise to problems of a, of a professional, a practical and ethical sort. So triggered by such professional practices related to medical examination and HIV testing. And so what I'm arguing and advancing to you today is that this situation matters to all of us, lest we be okay with continuing to support, however unwittingly our support is, harms and inequities that are noted to be happening through problematic professional and institutional practices um, that are revealed through the research that I'm gonna be discussing with you today and the, the, the recommendations that I set forth in my book that Professor Lemons mentioned screening out set to uh, correct. So there's a pedagogical purpose as well. Today, obviously, we're at the University of Toronto, but I'm sort of advancing that, you know, after today, now that we see issues and, and, and concerns, we can't unsee. And so when we learn about them, we can't unlearn. So did you know that if the late Stephen Hawking had wanted to settle in Canada, he would likely have been uh, denied. And the reason for this is because he was physically disabled. So the immigration system is a disabledist regime, um, which means that things are set up to work in such a way that specific bodies are devalued and enacted upon in particular ways through particular practices, some of which are longstanding and some of which are more recent. And I'm using the term disabledism as a contrast term to the one that we are perhaps more familiar with, which is ableism, which is the valuing of bodies. So what I'd like to invite you and us to do today is enter the inner chambers of the immigration system to learn how this immense um, sprawling bureaucracy works. And my uh, analytic starting point, whoops. And my analytic starting point um, is the perspectives of persons with chronic illness, disability, or genetic otherness. We can think of an HIV, we can think of an autism, we can think of a, a Down syndrome. And this is the, the very standpoint of people towards whom, or rather against whom, exclusionary federal immigration health uh, law and policy are uh, directed. <clears throat> So federal immigration law is organized to exclude such people from permanently settling in Canada on health grounds, with, with some exception. And the legal term for this is medical inadmissibility. So I am, um, I am an ethnographer. The kind of ethnography I do is called institutional ethnography, which is a Canadian sort of ethnography. Um, developed through the 1980s that uh, is interested in the organization and the production of, of, of knowledge associated with the, the late Dorothy Smith, sociologist. And so I'm an ethnographer interested in unpacking bu uh, bureaucracies so that we can understand the problems, how the problems we experience are produced. Um, and I am a storyteller. 
So let me tell you, um, and as Tudo said, bringing this right down into the ground level, tell you two stories. So the, the first you may be familiar with is of the Montoya family. Um, so Felipe Montoya and his wife Maria and our kids Tanya and Nico are Costa Rican nationals. And a number of years ago, uh, Felipe is, is still a professor at York University, an anthropologist, and Maria, a successful flamenco dancer and a business person. So they immigrated to Canada when he um, was granted a position, um, tenure track position at York University. So the four of them came, settled in suburban Toronto, um, and a number of years went by as they worked to set up a life here. Um, and when they went to apply for permanent residency, which would lead to citizenship, in a highly publicized uh, 2016 decision, um, they were refused based on the fact that their son, Nico, who you see here, lives with Down syndrome. So here you see Maria and you see Nico, uh, who is now in his mid teens. And so this family was gutted, but very angry, an affluent family. And so they began to mobilize and drop the ear of MPs, presented, um, um, had, had the help of lawyers and allied others to um, bend the ear of, of Ottawa. And ultimately, through um, coordinated action um, with collaborators, were able to stay, making a long story and a difficult story for the Montoya short. But they refused. They said, no, we are going to go back to Costa Rica. Thank you very much. And we'll, they currently are in Costa Rica. And they said the law and the policies that are prejudicial toward people living with Down syndrome or the existence of a medical exclusionary regime um, is problematic, is unfair. And because we're affluent, because we were able to mobilize, we should not be granted special um, concessions to stay on that basis, plus the fact they have lives that they live and live well um, in Costa Rica, they returned. And together they created, and this was before the 2006 decision, they created a terrific film that is angled or framed through social justice, human rights sort of narrative or discourses. And that's, um, and that's the, if I start hovering and playing around with this, I fear that the whole the presentation will collapse. So you can, you can look at uh, the site that's listed there. Right. And so the second story is, happens to be one of the protagonists of my book that Professor Kapuri could be now. Hopefully you're, you've satisfied, you've had your sandwich, your fingers are cleaned off on your napkins. I'm circulating the book so that you know it's, I think we read books, hardcover books, maybe less these years. So it's, it's a book that exists and just you can put your uh, fingers on the pages. But this is uh, the protagonist of my book. She's also a character in the movie I made that uh, Professor Lemons mentioned. Um, Martha is a real person. She happily could say, I'm happily happy to say she's still alive. She is an African woman. She was a student in, um, in Russia, African born, got a scholarship to study in Central Africa, um, was pursuing her PhD in the natural sciences and was interested in joining us here in Canada and becoming a permanent resident. So applied and spent about two or three years during her PhD training uh, doing the work to apply to Canada. A couple of weeks before her defense, um, she was asked, she was told that her process was, um, you know, um, 
moving along very quickly and she needed to come for a medical examination. So she was medically examined and found to be living with HIV. This was about 10 or so years ago. So overnight, her life changes. Her personal relationship is a bit now dicey. Her immigration to Canada, uh, from the information she's able to find online, is unsure, as is her sort of existential future, because in Russia, foreign nationals with <coughs> HIV are it's a reportable disease, as it is in Ontario, but First, foreign persons um, are also mandatorily tested yearly, but are um, to be expulsed and deported on that basis. And so she thought to herself, if I'm deported back to my country, will I have access to medications? What will become of me? So I tell these stories to really situate us in the personal in the policy and the lived implications of Canadian domestic immigration policy as it extends and goes deep and penetrates bodies across the globe, across time and place. And Martha, as it happens, for the hopes of hoping or the hopes of immigrating to Canada is rendered more vulnerable in many ways than she would have been had she not been tested. And so for the last 15 years, I have, time flies, I've examined HIV, I've examined the immigration system and its and its treatment of people living with HIV and the, um, the, 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 the organization around HIV within the immigration system, a system as a social, social researcher. Uh, during this time, I've also been involved in the HIV milieu uh, as a carer, uh, as, a, as, as a support worker, and through activism, um, nationally and internationally. And so this is the health condition that I'm going to focus on today to open up for our analytic scrutiny of the immigration system. Okay. So a central part of an immigration application is the, um, as a social process, is the medical examination. It's, it's among the, the highest of state priorities to know the bodily status of the applicants. Um, so this is a mandatory step that occurs um, for the most part outside of the country. And this is because most people who want to come and settle in Canada apply from outside of the country. So applicants such as Martha, you know, figure out wherever they are in the world, they figure out federal websites, they make appointments, they line up in queues, they do the work of waiting, of planning, of dispersing money, of hoping, of perhaps finding some sort of lawyer or immigration consultant online, they fill out forms, they pay more fees. Um, and they go back for repeat examinations the, because the results are only valid for six months. And so I've conceptualized these examples of formal and informal and big and small and ordinary and extraordinary activities um, that require effort and, and skill for people as um, immigration application health work. And this is what... You see it all right? Oh, should be the, the too dark. dark. Too romantic? <laughs> <laughs> too dark, you think? Or maybe a little Yeah, that's good. Yes. So, so this is the immigrant immigration application um Montaigne Goose or roller coaster to illustrate uh the applicate immigration application um, as a work process. So the immigration system is a textually mediated system that begins with and depends on a medical file. And so all that happens within the immigration system with regards to those who want to settle here and their health happens 
um, in relation to a medical file that a general practitioner inside or outside of Canada composes and all that he or she writes down or doesn't write down in the file. So each medical examination is between two to four hundred dollars and there are about 925,000 medical examinations that are done annual, annually by contract physicians working for um, the Canadian government. And the stakes of a negative medical assessment for a person such as Martha, for example, are really high. People can be screened out of being eligible for immigrating to Canada, depending on the results of their diagnostic tests, among other <clears throat> tests, and later stage legal or administrative or medical decisions made about them by bureaucrats, lawyers, and doctors working variously within the world and variously within the bureaucracy. So, rhetorically, the Canadian immigration system is understood to enable people to immigrate to our country to create a good life for themselves and their families. And while this can, can be and often, certainly often is the case, what disappears in such a, a positive narrative are the lived experiences and the material consequences for people who are rendered abnormal based on their existence, on their social and biological selves and their bodies, because an abnormal uh, uh, rendering by a doctor on a medical file that then journeys triggers uh, specific scrutiny. And I'm using this, I don't know if I did air quotes here, with abnormal, but this is the language. This is the official uh, language, the government language for uh, the group of people that uh, I I'm speaking about here with you today. Okay. So as a political sociologist, um, I wrote a book. I wrote a book that's now uh, circulating as a medical file does throughout the medical bureaucracy or the immigration bureaucracy throughout this this classroom for you to palpate. Um, this is a, an, an institutional ethnography in five chapters. And because I want people to read the book, and as I mentioned, my students in Scarborough did the work of reading it during the reading week last week, I wrote it in a particular way. I wrote it as a narrative-driven or story-driven analysis that it's written as a back and forth dialogue between Martha and an immigration doctor with me having a presence um, and doing analysis. So the analysis is embedded into, into the story. And lest we think it's, you know, just a story about one human and one doctor, no, there's, it's, a, it's a composite. Um, story, although Martha, the, the protagonist of the book, does exist and did exist when I did the, the field research, her story is supported by many, many, many other uh, applicants living with HIV, as well as many immigration doctors and lawyers and nurses and public health people and social workers and aid service organization workers so I arrive at a 365 or a, an X-ray of the immigration system uh, within the book. So through their exchanges of Martha and a doctor mm -hmm. called Meron, um, are the events, so through their exchanges are the events to which Martha's HIV diagnosis gives rise. And I show how things work from the inside out and the ground up uh, for new immigrant and refugee people with HIV and their families as they interact with social services, public health, uh, clinics, lawyers, housing services, criminal justice system, 
bureaucracies, disability services, community level service providers in Canada and elsewhere. And I did field work uh, in four Canadian cities in English and French and other languages through interpretation. And I did textual analysis of, of available published texts, as well as observational analysis at refugee hearings and in lawyer's offices, doctor's offices, for example, interviews with all sorts of people. And as well, marshaling my own experience as an insider um, to the HIV movement all, all of these years. So here I'm saying, um, and I've said a couple of times, all right, so coordinated work practices, professional practices of prof particular um, groups of professionals, lawyers, doctors, but also administrators or, or, or administrators or bureaucrats within the immigration system give rise to practices that are highly problematic for themselves, um, as well as applicants living with HIV and other ailments. But what exactly do I mean by highly problematic and for whom are things working problematically and, and what's the empirical basis for, for my claims? So here I'm gonna walk through three uh, slides. Um, the first is having us consider the institutional logic that governs the immigration systems medical program. So the Immigration Act or IRPA provides a distinct and discursively organized um, type of, of reasoning through which people, immigrants with HIV, um, doctors, government employers, lawyers, and doctors see and orient uh, and work with people living with HIV in their work of um, supporting the medical uh, system in their medical assessment. And what we see and what I found are um, the existence of particular exclusions and stratifications and inequities that are written into the HIV policy document um, when we examine what is written there for how it asks uh, professionals and administrators to work with people living with HIV. So some of these are based on geography. And here you see the countries of birth or origin of the persons with whom I spoke living with HIV. And so some of these are based on geography. So some of the mandatory tests are not available across the globe. Inequities relating to whether a person is already taking antiretroviral medication. Um, because if a person is already taking this medication, um, that's a problem. That, uh, uh, that, that, that's a problem for, for the government. And narrow understandings is of HIV as strictly a medical condition. When we know through the history of this particular pandemic that that's not the case, that it's a social, it's a political, um, and for that matter, health and medicine is always more than just a health condition or a medical condition. So, and what was very interesting was to hear that the people I spoke with talk about themselves using the language of the law or within the priorities of, of the government or, their, or of the state. So they've absorbed the relevancies as they get about um, in their self remedial work or their self education work to you know get healthy and to stop drinking in relation to their understandings of what population public health in Canada um, guides us and, and tells us you know sort of what is best for us. So geez, you know I'm 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 really going to cost the government a lot of money, or I certainly don't want to be um, posing a demand on the public purse and so on. So people really get to work to start, you know, improving themselves and changing themselves uh, post-diagnosis, aligning with the uh, norms uh, around um, public health and pop population health messaging. And so the second relates to institutional scrutiny and the particular scrutiny that HIV garners and attracts. And so this maze is, you might agree with me, is 
dizzying to look at. So imagine experiencing it, right? So this is a refugee applicant, a person asking for protection from the state as he or she makes the way in the first month of being here. And so this is what I was talking about, this immigration application health work and all that's required of the person. So a diagnosis with HIV through immigration procedures gives rise to specific forms of attention and interactions for the person living with HIV that are disease specific. So there's an extensive government work apparatus organized around HIV. The quality and quantity of documents that govern and track immigrants with HIV since 2002, um, in fact, um, in fact, there is no other disease or health con uh, condition that commands the, the quality or quantity of, um, uh, of, of, of institutional scrutiny that HIV does. So particular forms of government surveillance are then ushered in for the applicant living with HIV that makes way for practices uh, that wouldn't happen to Canadians or Canadian permanent residents um, lawfully. And so what we see is a wider window for exclusion of people living with HIV. And so, as I intimated before, uh, the HIV test is not just a diagnostic test because it organizes relations and governs interactions and has professionals and administrators work with people with HIV in particular ways that stretch well beyond the medical examination. And there are tensions associated um, with the test. And we, I communicated um, some of these tensions to you when I talked to you about Martha having been rendered more vulnerable for having to take a test as a foreign national living um, in Russia, right? Had she not tested. And the last, funny, it's counterintuitive. Okay. And so the last, um, Set of problematic um, practices, institutions, the sort of logic of things, the, the scrutiny and attention that's accorded to HIV. Um, here it relates to the practice of a certain type of doctoring that in 2013 in the Canadian Journal of Public Health I called immigration medicine. So the doctoring role of a contract doctor working for the immigration program um, is a form of administrative medicine, so or institutional medicine. So I've called this immigration medicine. So what we see happening inside and outside of Canada are serious inadequacies with how forms of patient care are carried out within the site of the immigration medical examination. Again, which have consequences for people that stretch well beyond the site of the medical examination. Test counseling before and after a, an HIV test, for example, um, as a standard of care, um, largely inadequate in the immigration medical examination when someone is, is tested for HIV. And so this is in my book, the, the site of analysis or the place within the institution. I mentioned before that how, how on earth can we understand the immigration system or the postal service or the public health, you know, any large bureaucracy, we can admit they're black boxy, right? Or so they sort of mystify us. We all we don't scratch our heads when we line up and are asked away and we go here, we go there, we think what, what on earth is going on, right? So this is an equivalent. We've all had experiences with bureaucracies like this and, and maybe some of you have ongoing experiences in this way sort of thing, right? But how we can track what's actually happening is to follow the medical file and so, and follow and follow and follow. There's some sort of saying that says follow the money and we find out we have here, here we're following the file. 
So what does the doctor do? What's written down? What isn't written down? And how that uh, journeys and where it goes and what people do with it. And so I, you know, can empirically observe and track through this medical file. And so what very, very intriguingly and troublingly is how this site of practice is organized to happen, the implications. So let me tell you about the immigration medical examination. So how the doctor is asked to work in this particular type of examination is in the interests of the government and not the person being examined. And so it's a regulated activity. Um, his or her medical examination is situated within relations of medical inadmissibility. So the person is searching for reasons to exclude the person. And so this finding disturbs taken for granted notions that uh, we might, you know, take it for, yeah, taken for granted assumptions about physician responsibility toward patients. Uh, it also means that this type of doctoring is at odds with professional and um, ethical principles guiding medical practice. Because in this context, the doctor is a textual fact finder, you know, on a mission to um, create a file. And so he's an administrator, or she's an administrator. Most actually all the doctors I, I talk to are men, so I keep I keep saying he. And so he's an administrator in this in this context. So his clinical reason, clinical reasoning, and his ability to work um in the subjective best interests of the applicant are elided. Uh, it makes it not very possible for the person to practice in that way because he is form-filling. Disturbing, surprising is that applicants generally don't know that they're being tested uh, for HIV and they don't understand initially the implications of this particular doctor-patient relationship. So, the Montoya's experience, Felipe and Maria, uh, and their, their life with Down syndrome, and Maria and Martha's experience with HIV um, are different, right? They live with different diagnosable conditions, and yet they can face a similar immigration outcome, that is to say a ruling of inadmissibility on medical grounds. And so a similar argument I'm suggesting applies to their circumstances. So independent of a particular health condition uh, or ailment, um, a similar argument can apply that medical inadmissibility produces problems that, are, that stem from its associated professional and bureaucratic practices. I'll make the time, right there. Okay. So, so medical inadmissibility in our federal immigration program uh, is achieved by making an applicant for permanent residency ineligible under the excessive demand clause because of anticipated future costs for caring for that person. But since the logic of such terminology and such exclusion is not self-evident, it must be pulled apart and analyzed. And so a first prima facie assumption <laughs> is that such barriers to immigration are undesirable. A second assumption is that we must understand and resolve harms that are created by immigration law and regulation and institutional practices. And the last assumption is that scholarship starting within the relevancies of people with firsthand experience with medical inadmissibility is valuable. And so the legal and policy persistence of medical inadmissibility triggers four dilemmas. And it's on this that I will conclude. Uh, first is a legal dilemma. So it may surprise you, and often does surprise <laughs> crowds of Canadians, 
to know that Canada is a legal outlier among fellow countries of the OECD, or the Organization of Economic Cooperation and Development uh, countries that have public health and social systems. So there are 38 OECD countries, and most of the, including those with formal immigration systems and those that have publicly funded healthcare systems, except would be would be immigrants, regardless of their health condition or developmental condition or genetic makeup. And so when I have presented to Norwegian, for example, or Dutch colleagues in particular, their mouths drop and they say, we can't believe you have this regime in Canada, this chafes with what we think of Canada. Um, and we had no idea. And isn't that bizarre? So the second is a demographic dilemma. So demographically, the context that I've described is concerning because our population is derived from, replaced by, and grows through <clears throat> immigration. So immigrant workers make social and economic contributions in Canada for between five and seven years. And this is a common time lapse between when people settle and citizenship. And that was, recall in the Montoya example, right? That was the sort of a gestation period and they were applying for citizenship. So people become fully socialized as Canadians during this time as the Montoyas did and consider themselves as such regardless of the, their official status on paper. Interestingly, as you probably are aware, double income families, the elderly, our children, health and social institutions across the country depend and have depended for hundreds of years um, on the contributions of um, labor, labor contributions of, of, of such people moving in and out of our country. And so residency and citizenship barriers impede the movement of, glo of a global workforce on which Canada uh, depends. And this is the lens or the frame of reference through which the film I made with some students in 2022, the unmaking of medical inadmissibility is, uh, is, is presented or argued. So there's a, also a political dilemma. And here is Mark Miller is now the Minister of Education. This is the prior Minister of Education, also liberal, uh, Ahmed Hussein. So that minister, but also this minister and the liberal, the government's position on the exclusion of permanent residents based on health status is at odds with what Minister Hussein called Canadian values a couple of years ago. And at odds with the domestic and international commitments to anti-discrimination, social justice, and human rights. So precluding permanent residency because of hypothetical future costs of caring for people is arguably against established public health, bioethics, health economics, and legal knowledge produced by Canadian scholars and other scholars around the world. And while two changes to medical inadmissibility, this regime were implemented in, in April 2018, which A, increased the financial threshold for excluding people, and B, rem removed speculated future costs of care on public social services for the same reason, mean that people with certain health conditions, including HIV because of patents, might now find it possible to permanently immigrate. A legal fact, though, does remain that health-based prejudice is built into and playing out as an organizing feature or an organizing logic of how the Canadian immigration system is uh, structured. And so the last is a social dilemma. So results from my long-term study that are articulated and presented in, in screening out demonstrate that the immigration system is, is and how it is structured around a textual reading of applicant persons that systematically disadvantages 
the disabled and the ill by producing them as risks. Calculating a person's so-called value using cost matrix and regression analyses and deductive reasoning as tools to evaluate a person's worth, as is currently the, the, the practice, is degrading to the human lives represented textually in the medical files and other Im immigration application documents. So if we accept that people with illness, chronic illness and disability and diverse uh, genetic makeups can and do contribute to society and offer perspectives that we might otherwise overlook, which I argue we must, then we are denying ourselves of the benefit of their offerings. Um, and maybe through question period, we can examine some of the authority issues um, that linger. I think the gender of about four or more, including how to reckon with a status quo that involves an immigration medical program that is very lucrative for private sector lawyers around the world, immigration consultants and doctors. This is this is this is a social fact. So how to rejig the status quo? How do we attend to others and imagine? And realize our future selves in in the PSW that you know cares for us, or how to value that person as much as we value ourselves. After all, we are dying at this very moment. We are becoming infirm. We are going this way and not this way in, in, in over the life course. And what what are we really talking about? What what are the root causes of all of this? Right. So exclusions based on bodily status predate confederation, a bit long trend back into the 19th century before the introduction of publicly subsidized health and social programming. Any impediment? Okay, so then how, how to decenter the economic logic that then, uh, you know, sits like an elephant. It seems to color all discussions that we can have with regards to this issue. Um, and that relates to, well, I've already talked about the thorny issues that linger, I guess. The, it relates to, um, you know, prevailing laws and, and the bureaucratic practices, as I mentioned, are, are contemporary iterations of longstanding within the, the, the context of this country, historical treatment of so-called abnormal bodies. So how might we rupture with the past? How to do that, right? Um, and so I'm, I'm, I'm doing some further research um, to develop new lines of inquiry. And I got funding from the Canadian Bar Association's uh, Law for the Future Fund to do so. Anyone interested in um, Training as a researcher interested in this topic, I would be delighted to hear from you. And I, I thought to give the last word, we circle back to Martha. Um, oops, let me move the, the bar. Oh, collapsing the shelves. I did it. Better late than never. So here, so this was actually a, a reader of my book who commented. Uh, a fellow professor, now Professor Emerita, who said, oh my gosh, I had no idea. And yet I'm you know, almost 80 years old. In, in, in reading this book, I had no idea that this exists. And so this circles me back uh, to the point that I made at the beginning, um, that this is also um, a time to sit up and pay attention, right? So we don't learn this stuff in school. We might ask ourselves, how is it that we don't learn it? problematize that, but now that we see, we cannot unsee, and now that you've heard and we can discuss today, you cannot un unlearn. Um, and as, as for Martha, what happens to Martha? Good question. So you'll have to read the book because one reader called it um, a compassionate and highly readable analysis of page turner. So is she successful? What happens to Martha is revealed in the end of the book. So thank you very much. I'll sit there and okay. I'll invite Valentina to uh, provide a brief commentary and then I'll open it up for questions. I have already some questions from the students 
written down. Okay. okay. You can sit there or you can stand here. It's like yeah, but it's fun to sit here. Hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Valentina, and um, I had the pleasure to, like, uh, at one point, being contacted by a journal to ask me to review uh, Laura's book. And uh, generally speaking, I don't review books very much because I am a sessional and therefore I take a lot of courses like uh, throughout the term and I don't really have time to review books so stuff like that but like uh, I saw the title and I because it's a topic that is uh, relates very much to my own studies then I thought okay I have to make an exception here because it's very interesting and I get this free book to to check and like uh, that was an excellent decision I made because like I literally love this book so much. Like uh, it's um, what I found particularly fascinating is that it's not like your usual academic book that has like lots of very important information, but in a in a sometimes in a dry format. In this book, like it's very catchy. Like uh, if you start reading, like it leads you like to the end. Like you have to finish because you want to know what happens to uh, to Marta. So in that sense, it's a, it's a very easy book to read. So you acquire a lot of information, but it's not heavy. It's not something that you say, okay, like I'm going to read another book that I stop, I do something else and come back. It's actually something that like catches your attention. It's like bringing you to the end. And like, uh, although it's very easy in that way, for me personally, it was also very difficult to read because like uh, I... I went through uh, lots of what Marta goes through in the book. I am an immigrant to Canada and I am a person with multiple sclerosis. I had to go through all these like insane process of immigration and like uh, it was really traumatic for me. And so because I saw a lot of me in Marta, it was difficult to go through it because like you really, again, uh, everything uh, like these like uh, uh, gigantic bureaucratic apparatus that uh, dehumanizes you at every step of the way. And it's really, really hard. So in that sense, it was a little hard to read, but like uh, that just because I connected to, uh, to my experience. Other than that, though, it was an excellent book. I recommend it to everyone, uh, especially because, as Laura was saying, this is a aspect of the immigration law that is not very much discussed, like uh, not only like at the uh, public level, but also like at the academic level. So I come from like. Uh, uh, my professional department of geography where immigration is a kind of a cornerstone of what we do and like uh, pretty much no one of my colleagues like uh, even like that have much higher position than myself like uh, know anything about this topic because most of the focus when you talk about immigration is on like uh, how do we accept people that are coming from different cultural backgrounds like how they integrate into Canadian society but these are aspects like the uh, medical admissibility provision is kind of this little dirty secret that we have that no one talks about and investigate. And I think instead it's very, very important to investigate because it tells us a lot of how like the um, political apparatus functions and how like the uh, law apparatus functions as well. So it's something that I think it's very, very important to uh, uncover as much as possible. And as I say, like I think this book does an excellent job with that because he's able to present this issue to a broad public. So you don't need to be like an expert in immigration to like uh, find this book interesting and valuable, but this can be actually like understood very easily by every Canadian. And I think it's important for every Canadian to have a sense of what is being done in, uh, in our name on a daily basis to other human beings. I think like uh, I'll conclude okay. like that and leave more space for people if they wanna ask. You, to... you can sit here and 
if you want, and uh, there will be questions, and if okay. you want to intervene as well. Okay. Okay. So, um, as usual, I have um, received some questions beforehand from the students okay. who um, who uh, read the chapter in the book and uh, maybe watched the movie. And so I'll start with some, and if you uh, have an urgent question, don't feel shy to put up your hand, but I'll start with uh, Roya. Mm -hmm. Okay. Um, I feel like the question was answered actually during the presentation. Okay. Um, but yeah. it was, yeah. You have another one? Oh, or? no, I, it was answered. Okay, very good. Okay, uh, Chris? Yeah, so I had a question. I think I'm going to change it here on the spot, though. So I was interested. I focused mostly on the first chapter of the book, and you allude to the recommendations a bit, but I wasn't entirely sure what the recommendations were. So I was hoping you could touch on that a little bit. Sure. Um, so there are three, three recommendations that I made. The first is um, to sit up and pay attention. So to learn this, to know this for the reasons that Valentina mentioned, that this is a real mission. If, if we're to say that the immigration system is a core social institution, I think we can agree on that. And we learn all sorts of other, uh, I mean, I took political studies at university and uh, you would think that in, in political studies that you would, you know, um, when we talk, when we learn about um, Canadian public administration, for example, there's not a mention anywhere of the immigration system, as Valentina said, let alone of the medical dimension uh, there. So, you know, first is a, is, is a call to action, if you will, to, to know about this stuff. Uh, second, uh, my tired brain, um, the second recommendation is to, um, is to um, change the um, institutional practices. And here I also include professional and bureaucratic practices that relate to the inadmissibility regime. So um, that is the second. Um, and the third is to uh, repeal the um, mandatory HIV testing. And so call for particular forms of public education, a change and an overhaul to how medical <clears throat> inadmissibility gets done in people's practices inside and outside of Canada, and a change to how um, HIV is conceptualized and acted upon uh, in the site of the medical examination and elsewhere. Um, those are the three um, recommendations. And so, because it's a, it's a science, a crafting experiment and effort to craft recommendations. And so those three recommendations are doable, or in other words, they're actionable, they're possible, um, and they're empirically, the empirical evidence that I provide in the book show that these three things are necessary. They're necessary social goods. Um, and so the evidence, in an evidence-obsessed uh, sort of world, where evidence can be also ignored, but the evidence for acting in these ways is, is provided through the book. Um, Alex. Oh, I'm Alex. Uh, uh, okay. Oh, I was going to ask a question. Yeah, yeah, maybe on the follow up. Okay, go ahead. What? Oh, ask my follow up. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Well, no, I mean, my follow up sort of is my question that I was wondering, anyways. Um, so, I mean, you alluded to in chapter one, um, how like the the um like the bodily status of um, immigrants uh, who are applying um, sort of act as like a filtering process for immigration. And I guess what I'm wondering is if the filtering process is necessary, then sort of what do you suggest is a better substitute? Like what's a better filter than the bodily status of immigrants 
and sort of connected to that, like, do other countries have a better system that you think that we should adopt? Great questions. And I would say, yes, we could do what all EU countries do, for example, which is, uh, you know, uh, a Belgium and it, a Belgium and Italy um, as uh, countries in which, um, um, yeah, the, actually the countries that have formal immigration programs as well, um, and receive immigrants as, as we do, um, are concerned as they should be, I suppose, about the, the health, right, of the people incoming. So where a Belgium and an Italy do, and you can say, say all countries of the EU actually, what, what, what practiced is to examine people, but on the basis of result, there's no exclusion that happened. So sure, start within the medical examination, by all means, medically examine people, know what you know we have so as to be able to take care of the person and lead the person to the public health system. So that, that, that's it, that's it in a nutshell. So at, at the moment, Canada's system aligns it with places such as Saudi and Russia and Qatar and uh, Iran and, and, and places like this, right? That Canada is, because Canadians can be smug where its social institutions are concerned. Smug and ignorant at the same time, clearly. If, if we don't know, if we're not taught about the Canadian immigration system, then we're ignorant about it, right? But we can be smug, it, ironically or interestingly enough. Um, and we don't often think of ourselves as bedfellows with these other sort of, you know, nasty countries or however you want to typify. But let's bring ourselves more into alignment with a Norway, with a Sweden, with, with you know, with Iceland or, you know, whatever. That, that, those are... That's, 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 those are the answers, right? May I ask a follow-up question? Okay. Um, so is the difference between what our system is and then like some of the EU countries that you mentioned, is it just that like when, like, so, okay, so Marta or Martha, for example, like she had an HIV diagnosis, but then was able to um, like become a permanent resident anyways. So is the difference between our system and the EU system just that like, like Canada, there's sort of like a presumption that an applicant would have to overcome once they have a diagnosis, whereas like there's no presumption in the EU countries that they would have to overcome? Yeah, so there's no there'd be no exclusion based on on a person's health status, and in 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 regards to Martha, yeah, her example shows at the at, at once discretionary um, decision making, right? Of which there's a literature of visa and immigration officers and and, and this sort of thing. Um, um, lost my train of thought. The Um, yeah, I lost my train of thought. No, I mean, it's a, it's a cost issue. Huh? So, in the Canadian context, it's really calculating the cost to society, huh? just, like the financial that the that, disease will bring. Can I just add something? Just to clarify, like, so the issue here is that, like, uh, according to Canada, this is a monetary issue, like uh, certain people, because of their medical condition, yeah. represent an extreme excessive burden on the, like, uh, finances of this country in terms of health care. Now, there is no study that anyone in Parliament has presented indicating exactly what this cost is. I argue that actually it's moron to think that like the Canadian state like is had to avoid this cost because they are excessive. Like the fact that the Canadian the healthcare system is currently crumbling is not because of a few immigrants that may have disabilities, but it's because of a whole bunch of other factors that have put it on this uh, on this foot and that I'm not going to investigate here. But I think is like a system that like is plainly discriminatory. So this system like 
sent me a letter saying that like I couldn't come to Ghana. They rejected my application because they defined me as a burden for the system. That is absolutely false. So the only reason why I'm here today is just because like I found an escamotage, like it seems like I'm married to a Canadian. So at the end they had to accept me. But like just to define a human beings that like uh, works and like pay taxes as a burden for the system is inconsistent. Unless you can demonstrate to me that that's the case. And no one in parliament has ever done that. But I, I think what's important here is to keep history in context, right? Is to say that invariably we talk about cost, cost for this, cost for that, um, as we should, right? We should be concerned about disease. We should be concerned for costs and costs of care, et cetera. But as I said earlier, right, this, this, um, problematic predates the introduction of healthcare, predates the introduction of uh, socialized medicine. This, this is something actually that comes out of, by this point, outdated 19th century public health thinking. It comes out of a eugenics uh, frame. It comes out of um, British colonialism, actually, and, and the preoccupation, the moral preoccupation with what people do, when they do it, with whom they do it, where they do it, and so the intersection with such things as risk, not only financial, but the intersection with, with, with you know, sort of discourses on crime and criminal law and this sort of thing. So wherever, I mean, within OECD countries that were colonized, um, well, the last colonizers were the English crown or the British crown, I should say. We can look at Australia and New Zealand and Canada, which in the world have the have not identical but similar types of peculiar uh, relate state relationships to the body and all that our bodies do. Um, Focusing on and the, the, the uh, medical inadmissibility regime. So though the, the clustering of countries have really um, um, looking at a good the, immigrant physically, <laughs> yeah, and, and, and stuck to the sort of outdated type of thinking that the UK has actually distanced itself from in the twentieth century, right? But the sort of large uh, immigrant colonies. Um, still struggle with this in inadmissibility sort of regime in various ways, differently in the three countries. Um, but I mean, that, that's the bigger historical piece. And I just want to say Valentina, I mean, Valentina has written a very important book that was listed in the, in the promo in the poster. It's called Not Good Enough for Canada, uh, Canadian Public Discourse Around Issues of Inadmissibility for Potential Immigrants with Diseases and or Disabilities. And so her historical work was from 1902 to 2002. So this ambitious century long examination, right, of, of inadmissibility um, has tracked in policy and law, public papers, public discourse. And interestingly, um, where her study leaves off in 2002 is where my study picks up with the HIV policy mandatorily being put into place in 2002 to 2022. So she has a, a century in where she leaves, where her ink dries at the end of her book making process, mine takes up and tells the story for the next 20 years differently versus a book of legal history and policy history that I would say we could have a good book, book event where the two are in dialogue with each other. But I, I think they're, they're in some ways two parts of each other, right? Yeah. Very good. So um, uh, maybe uh, in this connection, um, Lil, uh, Lily's, uh, uh, Vivian's uh, question. Yeah, to, uh, I'm sorry, I had a follow-up. I had a follow-up. Yeah, I mean, it's related, but anyway, I mean, you can start, but otherwise, uh, mm -hmm. maybe let's start with uh, yeah. Lily. Yeah. Oh, sure. Um, I I have like a question that I wrote before listening to the talk, and then I actually kind of have a separate question now. But it, um, Does it follow up? Otherwise, we'll... 
uh, I can ask, yeah, I can ask my new question later. My original question was just kind of based on your experience regarding uh, applicants kind of like ideas of Canada before they were applying versus kind of like through the application process and how are, um, I guess, discrimination almost of, you know, like health and disability, did that change a role in the perception of Canada, either like after coming here, or did some of them change their minds? How did that kind of impact the application process? There's two things. People that I uh, met with were um, apprehensive about criticizing. Um, they were in the midst of their process. So it was um, difficult to get people to voice this, although then through time, um, and actually looking at their documents and what they're actually then obliged to do with documents sort of, you know, the length of my arm sort of thing. I mean, while they might not critique the sort of bulletin of evidence or books of evidence that they have had. And so that's how I did that map to show, geez, you know, people are really sort of like going through a meat grinder here with all sorts of activities. So people reticent to critique because in a, power hierarchy, I mean, they're low down, right? They're sort of asking either for protection of the state or they're insecure about their process. That's the first part. The second though, I'd like to illustrate with um, through the experience of a woman from Brazil who was not HIV positive, but who was adamant in taking part in my, um, in my study. She is a public health, is a public health nurse. She's probably 65 now. She lives in Sao Paulo, Brazil, public health nurse and was very active in Brazil's response to AIDS and the production of generic medicines and, um, and, and is an ethicist. I met her at McGill when we were at McGill. And uh, she came uh, as a postdoc fellow, and I tell this sort of story in the book too, she, she comes as a postdoc fellow with other Brazilians and other uh, scholars from the EU, and it's um, once in Canada that she discovers her and her Brazilians, you know, around the, the, the dinner table having a drink with the, the Europeans, that they learn that they, as Brazilian nationals were tested for HIV, but none of the Europeans were. And she said, you know, this is, this was uh, in, so in Brazilian Portuguese, they're like, oh my God, you know, so German, you know, HIV is okay, but Brazilian not. So, you know, if, if there's, if there's going to be a policy and if they're going to be practices, let them be uniform and let them be rolled out to everybody. Um, and so she, she, why she was adamant and why she wanted to participate and tell me all about her immigration application health work, what that looked like having to go to Trinidad and having to, you know, be, be delayed and almost not be able to accept the postdoc and, you know, and so on and so on and so on. Um, and yeah, she, she was, she was, she, she said to me in the end of the quotes of the book, but she said, you know, never will I look at Canada the same, you know, Canada again is sort of glib and, and we have a certain ideologic image of Canada and its immigration system. And boy, I've seen just like Valentina sort of said, you see that you live the underbelly of that. And she said, you know, Asta, that's, that's, I can't, I can't unsee, I can't unknow now. Mm -hmm. Fascinating that the couple with uh, their child, uh, you know, decided that not to come anymore. People yeah. get upset, you know, and feel, feel betrayed by the system. Yeah, and he, and Felipe is now a colleague and one of the, so I made the, the film with uh, five students to the Jackman uh, Humanities Institute, the Jackman um, Scholars and Residents, terrific, and, and, and um, Tanya is, is the author's the daughter, Tanya, is one of the collaborators in my medical exclusion project. And she was the illustrator, uh, one of the illustrators, because they all illustrated and did sound and all, all, all sorts of other parts of the film. We collaborated on that, but she, the illustration that I use for Martha is, is Tanya. So is the sister of Nico, is the, the daughter of uh, Maria and Felipe, um, and so was obviously sort of, you know very invested, interested in the project. And, and, um, yeah, so, so then they you know lived happily ever after in Costa Rica. So you would say that this is a loss. Economists friends would say you know well you know if it's not the Montoya's if it's not Valentina well there's someone else chewing up behind. That's what economist friends have said to me with regards to this issue. Maybe. Maybe we could, I mean, I think we could have a debate, but I mean, we could say that Felipe Maria uh, and family are net losses for our country. 
I must say it uh, resonates as well with uh, the stories I've heard, like personal testimonies of, of things Canadians often don't realize, like, for example, problems of, of family reunions of immigrants who are here, uh, for example, as refugee children stuck in the, in the Congo and the bureaucracies of, of years of trying to get the children to come and join them. It's, it's actually stunning that people don't realize how, how hard it can be for various reasons to kind of get through the immigration mill. Um, Erica, so your question, I have to unfortunately run, you know that, so uh, there may be a class starting here around two, so you have 10 more minutes. Uh, I want to personally thank you already, but I'm sure that you'll get an applause after which will be the conversation. Um, sorry, just uh, going on from the understanding that the Canadian system looks at immigration from a monetary perspective. Um, do you think there's a difference or maybe should there be a difference in how we argue for a change when it comes to refugee immigration versus economic immigration? So the federal skilled workers and uh, that group which comes in for work as compared to refugees, do you think it, there's a benefit to make that differentiation in this analysis? Um, I think to say two things is, I would like to center this issue that the immigration system is a massive moneymaker for professionals. And I named them private sector lawyers and, and immigration consultants and doctors. And I think where we talk about change I, um, aspirationally or practically, I think that this is a key impediment as to um, why things don't change and why things are as they are. Um, you know, problems are noted, they've long been noted, now there's evidence. And so, you know, the, the, re, the rejigging of things, um, since, it's a, it, since it's a system, that costs us. If we look, if if we you look at the usual way of approaching this, oh boy, people cost our healthcare system a lot. The immigration system is a massive opportunity, professional and and career opportunity for um, scores of people throughout the world. And I, I think that I mean we we need to talk about that and to to sort of destabilize the status quo happening of things. Okay, so that's a. And the, the point about the differentiation the, in IRPA, right? It's the Immigration and Refugee Protection Act and its regulations. Yes, so there's, there's, a, there's a, this uh, act and its regulations related to, to uh, silos of, 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 of applicants, if you, if you will, right? An immigrant and, and, a, a, and a refugee. So it is the case that a refugee person, a person coming here or who is sponsored outside and arrives, can, can uh, that per whatever the person, you know, lives with, the, the health cannot be used as a basis for exclusion. However, and I have a hard time making my colleagues that, for example, within refugee studies, because unfortunately, refugee studies and immigration studies can be separated. Or, I mean, I'm still a member of York Center for Refugee Study, which historically is run by fantastic feminist geographers, and it was a great site. And they said, "Yeah, but you don't do refugee research." So I will say, and I say throughout the book, always talking about refugee and immigrant persons first of all, so that we don't get captured by a classification system that is the language of Burpa. Right? We're not. You're not an immigrant or refugee. You're you're a, you're a person requesting something in the case of, of being a refugee, or you're making an application from the priorities of your own world as an as an immigrant. Um, so while people who and that's the most people, why was I able to talk to so many people about this? Is because most people, not all, were people in this country, which is a reflection of our immigration and refugee system. So that they were already inland, right? They were already here. They've arrived by plane or at, at, at land border, um, and they're asking to stay. They're asking for stay within the country. That they can't be denied is a legal fact. 
However, that in no way diminishes the uh, work, the anxiety, the uh, efforts. They are parallel with a person who doesn't have such a protection. That is an, an, an immigrant. Uh, for example, so the, 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 in the experience of the thing and well after being accepted, you know, I went to how many refugee hearings, well after getting accepted, I mean, there's the chronic worry of, you know, they know I have HIV in Ontario, it's a reportable condition, right? So public health sort of will follow up in Quebec where you know, that doesn't happen in the same way, all the jurisdictions and stuff are different. But that in no way that the, this the, the, the no way uh, reduces or assuages, you know, because there's a difference between how we experience the law and the law, right? The law is sort of this, but the experience of the policy and the law and all the regulations is 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 what matters or what comes into view here. Yeah. Sorry, but do you think it would be more palatable to policymakers, for instance, if you propose that? Um, remove mandatory HIV testing for refugees because the reason we're bringing them in is not for their economic value, but it is for their protection as compared to federal workers or immigrants coming on to work in Canada who are supposed to be economically viable for Canada. So would it possibly sit well in the Canadian parliament if this argument was to be made? Are you talking about the mandatory test or the yes. exclusion? Just mandatory testing for HIV. Those are from the line of policy makers. I, I mean, I, I know that in the, the immigration um, medical branch, uh, the, the, the medical branch, right? I, when I up when I published the, the book, I updated the data, and I was in communication with the then director. His name was Casey, he was on PEI, and then he was in Ottawa, and he's probably shipped on now, but you know, never has there been a study of this, never have, has there been a study of the sort. It was, you know, challenging to get the data, but you know, sort of su supply the numbers, number of doctors, number of radiologists, um, didn't have a discussion with him, Sean was his name, didn't have a discussion about, um, you know, the repeal of the mandatory tests or the wording. I don't know, I, I mean, I, Purposes of the law, that there's sort of two streams are there, as we say, right? The sort of refugee and immigrant. Um, I don't know if um, I don't know, maybe your, your your question is 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 I I, yeah, I'm not, I don't know how to answer it. Really, or, okay, or I don't think anyone would ever that. agree to like uh, drop the mandatory testing. It's just a question of like because the HIV is a communicable thing, so like uh, no government will do that. If you're talking about the exclusion, though, that's different. And refugees are not, like, they cannot be excluded because of a medical condition. It's already, like, in the legislation. And I think, I mean, the, the mandatory, the history of the um, introduction of the policy that I talk about, I think it's in Chapter 3, is, a, is an interesting history, right? So it's in the 90s that the then what was now the, it's now the Canadian HIV Net, uh, no, the HIV Legal Network. We're called the Canadian HIV AIDS Legal Network, leading the um, the camp campaigning against what what the government initially said that the health department and the immigration department, as the fourth before the fourth immigration act was finalized, the federal government branches relating to public health and immigration um, cooperated. Um, uh, collaborated with each other, and the initial suggestion was, well, to test to test everybody, and exclude including uh, including refugees. And so from there, there was a sort of uh, mobilization, and at that time, a letter writing campaign that was um, successful in one way, in that it succeeded in. Um, advocates or activists succeeded in not. Um, in, in removing the exclusion, so the automatic exclusion, um, and what the some inadvertent side effects of that activism was was it that actually my assessment will um, catalyze the whole 
catalyze a whole bureaucracy and a whole type of checking, check and balance and monitoring system around HIV. So if we have an extraordinary surveillance system of HIV, it's in part because the government that said, said, okay, well, we'll put in counseling, we'll put in testing, we'll take care of people. And so created all of these um, bureaucratic um, forms to build sort of show that sort of ideological performance and the ideological uh, work of, 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 of being able then to say that, you know, oh, we, we are counseling, we are testing, we are referring. Um, so, yeah, perhaps the moment in time for repealing mandatory testing um, has passed, but certainly it was um, a point of activism historically. Uh, the city actually, you know, much more attention. I'm out of time. There's no class. Thank you. Steve, you have other questions? Thank you for your attention and your questions.